All right. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the Sunday morning prayer at the start of service. Uh, as we begin this morning, let's look into the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 19 through 24. And he answered them, O faithless, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this ha been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. So last night, uh, at 12.30, I was once again at the edge of despair. I had spent much of the day trying to prepare a prayer for this morning, and my best efforts were hardly cohesive at this point with the prayers only related to the scripture by some creative thinking. I messaged Pastor Tommy about it, and he assured me and told me not to stress about it, to ask God to help me, and that he will. And at this point, I stressed out more because it felt like I had been asking God to help me all day, all week for this matter. And earlier that day, I had been talking with a brother about how one of the struggles that plagues my walk with God is this frustrated doubt that sometimes makes me wonder, is my prayer effective at all? It may be ironic that someone who struggles with prayer is up here leading prayer. And I confess, I am a man of little faith but even so, I will pray, because as strange as it sounds, we don't put our faith in our faith. That is, it's not my faith itself that accomplishes things, but rather, it's the God we pray to whom we put our faith in, so that even if our faith is only the size of a mustard seed, we believe this is not fruitless. So, even if we have unbelief, we should still have enough belief to at least come to God. And this belief is rooted not in our own faith or ability or who we are, but rather in God's ability and who He is. Uh, he is a good God, He is a wise God, a loving God, an almighty God. So this morning, let's come before God in prayer and remember what we do believe about His nature and character.
interact with you reflects what we believe about you. And conversely, Lord, what we believe about you drives how we interact with you. So this morning, we pray that you would remind us of who you are, Lord, and, uh, in truth, Lord, and not in the, that we don't fall to these false images that we've built of you, Lord, from our own guesswork or assumptions. Lord, we know that you are not a distant God, but you are a close God. You, you have given us your spirit. You are a loving Father, and you, are, you're, you see us when we cry, and you hear us when we pray. Lord, we know that uh, you are a just and merciful God, and that you seek our good and, uh, and for our development and our growth in you, Lord. And that you give us good things when we ask. Apostle Father, I pray that uh, you would remember these things from your word and dwell in them, Lord, and so that we would continue to look to you and look to you truly. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, for the second half, if you are struggling with doubt and prayer, uh, let us do as the Father did in this passage before, and you know, lay it before Jesus. Now, we can't fake our trust in him as if appearances would produce results. So this morning, let us surrender our doubts to the Lord in honesty, asking the Holy Spirit to help us overcome them.
Father, I come before you this morning. Uh, I confess I, I often do not know what I am doing. But Lord, I pray that uh, you would expose to my heart uh, any foolishness or stubbornness that may be preventing me from, uh, from hearing you, Lord. Father, it's oftentimes I struggle to reconcile what I know with what I experienced, Lord, and to how to hold those two in, in, in reality and, and understand what's going on. But Father, I pray that you would give me patience and to, to continue to strive towards you, Lord, not to, to give up or give in to frustration. Lord, that you would continue to lead us by your spirit, uh, even if we don't have the answers, Lord, and if we don't uh, recognize your voice or remember it, Lord, I pray that you would teach us and, and open our eyes and open our ears to perceive you and to to meet you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
the secret in the quiet place in the stillness you are there in the secret in the quiet hour I wait only for you because I want to The secret in the quiet place, in the stillness you are there. In the secret in the quiet hour I wait only for you. Cause I want to know you more. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to tell. You are the treasure that I seek. 
You are my all in all. I'm seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. You're my strength. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise His name. The King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I. Truth shall 
Yes, Lord, you are exalted. Lord, we're here to, to bask in your presence amongst brothers and sisters, Lord, as we dedicate this time to you as a family. Um, Lord, we just pray that you speak through Pastor Sai as he gives us your word. And just uh, be with those that still may be on their way here, Lord. Pray that you grant them safe passage. And we just lift up all of today into your hands, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Pray for the lights. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, good to see you all. Okay, we're going to uh, play the video that we watched last uh, Sunday about Operation Christmas Child. So, um, Nathan, can you cue it up? Operation Christmas Child or the Shoebox Ministry is one of the ministries of Samaritan's Purse. It is a great mission project for children. Each year, millions of boxes are collected and shipped to children in developing countries. Each box is an important tool to share God's love and to spread the gospel. We want to thank all of you for your kind support for the past years. Thousands of boxes have been packed and delivered through EFCOC. There are three ways to participate and support this year. First, come by our booth to pick up some boxes in the next two Sundays. Fill them up with gift items, then drop them off at Church Collection Area by November 14th. Second, we welcome money donation. Simply write a check payable to Samaritan's Purse or donate cash of any amount at our booth in the next three Sundays. Cash collected will be used for gift items. Or you can simply go to the Samaritan's Purse website and click on Operation Christmas Child and follow the instructions on the website to donate money online or to pack your shoeboxes online. The link for the website will be included in our Sunday Bulletin for the entire month of November. We hope you find great joy in participating in this meaningful event. Remember, there are many places in the world that we won't be able to go, but these two boxes can. that brings back some good memories of just past years of doing this ministry but you all are familiar with Operation Christmas Child uh, shoebox ministry and um, yeah we gave this announcement started last week uh, this Sunday and then the next uh, two Sundays we'll be um, handing out boxes and so there will be a booth set up in the social hall lobby and uh, you can go there and pick up boxes um, and then that's also where you can return them in the next few weeks. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, if you'd like to donate, um, feel free to donate. You can do, do cash or check um, to Operation Christmas Child. And, um, yeah, this is just a, a great way for us to participate in this big ministry that is, you know, goes around the world. Um, and, 
if you want more information on that, then the website is very helpful. You can find um, any details that were not covered uh, in the video. Um, and if you have any more questions, uh, you, know, you can also see uh, our sister Candy. Uh, she can also help you out with that, okay? Uh, and along with that, so on, so two days before the due date, so November 14th is the last uh, Sunday that we'll be collecting the boxes. Um, so that Friday before, we'll be going to a local Target store uh, to actually shop for our boxes. You're free to uh, pack your boxes before then too, but this is just an activity that we're doing as a group on Friday night. Um, and so we'll, we'll go to the store and then we'll go you know, shop for items for the box that we're going to be packing for um, personally, okay? Um, so if, uh, if you're on the younger side, uh, make sure you let your parents know so they can give you some money to spend um, on that night, okay? And try to be here by 745 so that we can get everyone um, in cars and we'll carpool over, okay? All right, of course, uh, if you're coming later for whatever reason, uh, you can always meet us there okay, if you drive. All right. Um, oh, and then there's one more. Uh, so daylight savings is next weekend. Okay, so we're gonna get an hour back, fall back, not spring forward. Um, so remember Saturday night, sometime uh, before you go to bed, just set your uh, clocks back, um, or else you'll be early here. <laughs> right? Yeah. I know. Wish we didn't have to announce this one, but. Okay, so because I'm holding the mic, you know I'm not speaking today. Uh, Pastor Tsai is here to give the message, so let's let's welcome him. Invite him. Reverend Wang, EM leaders, brothers and sisters, saints of Christ, greetings to you. It's always an honor to be here sharing the Word of God. And I fully understand uh, you may want to nail me to the cross on the wall behind me rather than listening to me preaching here behind this stand. I understand that. I can feel it. But there's a time for everything. So can we listen to what the Lord has to say through his servant first, and then after the service, I'm all yours. Shall we pray? Father God, grant us your word, your word for your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to thank uh, John for your prayers this, this morning. Uh, a lot of times prayers are more a battle than just a, you know, praise. Uh, and that, that is really profound. And, and thank you, Scott, for the wonderful message through the songs. Powerful message. So today I would like to share with you the Lord's Prayer. It's a prayer of intimacy. Now, what are people celebrating tonight? Your friends, the community, what are they celebrating tonight? Halloween. Halloween. What are the church people celebrating today? <laughs> yeah, it was Sunday. Today is the Reformation Day. And this year, it happens to be the Reformation Sunday. It falls on a Sunday. October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis on the wall of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany. And that sparked a Reformation movement that really lasted. See, before him, there were many Reformers. Uh, but he is the one that really 
caused a lasting Reformation Protestant movement. And then the, the principal uh, idea of this Reformation Protestant movement is to lead the saints of the Lord back to the Bible. Not so much leaving the church, right? At that time, the Catholic Church really went astray. But the reformer is calling out to the saints of the Lord and say, come back, come back to the principal teachings of the Bible. What does the Bible say essentially, right? So the early reformers started to realize that most people growing up in the Catholic Church never really read the Bible, don't know what the Bible teaches, don't know what uh, you know, the, the, the principle of Christian life is about. What do we believe in? Whom do we believe in? And after we receive this salvation grace, what should we do with our lives? What are, what are the expectation of the Lord? And then, even by knowing all these, what we should do, what we should not do, we just can't do it. We're just human beings. So very early, they realized that they need to teach the three principal um, fundamental teachings of the Christian faith and of the Bible. And the first one is the Apostles' Creed. It's a creed of Trinity, which I shared with you earlier this year. And then the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is a decree of grace. After we receive the salvation of Jesus Christ, what should we do then in our life? What is the Lord expect us to reflect to his grace in a reverent way? And then by knowing what God tells us not to do and what God called us to do, still we're incapable of doing it. Right? The things that we know we should do, oftentimes we just omit the things that we know that we shouldn't do or shouldn't say, I shouldn't have say, said that word, but it just, you know, fly out of my mouth. So how do we draw the strength to do what the Lord wants us to do? And that's the Lord's prayer. The Lord's prayer is a prayer of intimacy, helping us, leading us to be able to really follow God's will in a reverent and great, uh, grateful way. Right? So last week, Reverend Wong shared with us from Hebrews uh, chapter 12, 28. I'm, sh I'm sure you kind of remember one of the last phrase. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Right? So from the mountain of Sinai, it's more like a mountain of fear. You have to do, you have to work, you have to perform, you have to achieve in order to receive the blessing. But when we come to the mountain of Zion, it's the mountain of grace, right? Reverend Wang shared with us last week. It's a mountain of grace where you know that you have received all these unshakable kingdom, the grace, the mercy of the Lord. And then how do we offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. And that's what the Lord's Prayer is teaching us. When the Hebrew says acceptable worship, he's not talking about just coming to Sunday worship, coming, you know, 
uh, serving in a committee or doing the media work, wonderful work, you guys. The worship is actually our life. Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. The worship is from here, from here, from here, and every day your encounter with different people. Our life is worship, and we worship with reverence and awe because not because we have to obey and then in a fearful way that you know if we don't do right if we don't say the right thing God will just punish us no God grant us the grace of salvation redemption already and so once we receive this kingdom that cannot be shaken this mountain of Zion, the mountain of grace. So much grace, we don't deserve it at all, but Jesus Christ died on the cross with his torn body and shed blood. Grant us this kingdom that cannot be shaken. And now we offer this acceptable worship. Now, so, why, why did the disciples ask Jesus to teach them how to pray? They were Jewish. They were Jew. They pray three times a day. It's, it's their life. Morning, early afternoon, uh, and then early evening. They're not unfamiliar with prayer. Why would they ask Jesus, teach us how to pray? They knew. They knew how to pray. But disciples marveled at the power of, and the teaching of Jesus Christ. Every time Jesus retreat to the wilderness, retreat to the mountain and pray, he came out fully charged fully charged to the point of miracles, just, you know, winners by thousands of people. Five loaves, two fish, feeding 5,000. Blinds, seen, lambs, walk, even dead people, rise. And so, what what was Jesus' prayer so powerful that, that he could do without limitation what God wants us to receive? Right? So the disciples, after three and a half years, or, or maybe before three and a half years, they, they follow Jesus, they observe Jesus, and they realize that prayer, prayer is what empowers Jesus to fulfill his destiny. So through prayer, Jesus was empowered to not only fulfill the laws, and we know this because the Bible says Jesus is without sin. Even before Jesus came out to the public to serve, Jesus was empowered by his devotion, his prayer to the Father to fulfill all the laws. And then he gave the laws new meanings and implications. So we read over and over in the New Testament, Jesus said, you heard what the Bible says. But now I tell you what it really means and how you can really live. Live out what the Lord requires. Right? So there was 30 years of character building, obeying God's law to perfection. 
And then there's the three and a half years of public ministry. Now, I don't know if you have ever wondered this. Why would the Father God only allow Jesus three and a half years of service? Wouldn't it be much better if Jesus can serve for 10 years, 15 years? How many more miracles? How many more wonderful teachings? Right? Jesus could be a bestseller. He could have, you know, author books teaching us many things. Why just three and a half years? Well, Yesterday, we were at the uh, Sky Rose Chapel in the uh, Rose Hills. And the young family reserved the Sky Rose Chapel because they, they want people to have social distance, right? not to crowd in that chapel, but ended up the Sky Rose Chapel was packed. 300 plus people. No spare room. Some people even have to went upstairs. And then you can just feel that, that heavy sadness. And the question, though not spoken, is so loud, it echoes in that chapel, the question of, why? Why? Pastor Will presided the memorial service. And he said, he said, when I first heard the news, I have this question of what happened? What happened exactly? What, what is the situation? He wanted to know, find out exactly what happened. And then after a few days, his question move from what happened to why. Why? And then yesterday, Pastor Will reminded us that we may never know the answer. Why would God receive a life so so bright and so full of hope and, you know, a, a, a life that is only begun, uh, only begun to, to shine. Why? We may never know why, but what we do know is the answer is in God's hand. God has all the answers. And God also gave us the hope to press on. Right? To press on. One day we will know why, but before then, God assured us that He is with us. He will lead us through. And when I presided the interment service at the graveside, we surrender this beautiful life, spirit, soul, and body into the care of the author of life. And we just surrender. Surrender and trust that God will take care of this beautiful life in us. Right? So, you know that I, I didn't have the, the honor of associating with Christine, except for several times I visited the hospital, pray over her, pray with the family. And then yesterday I heard, you know, the families and friends share uh, the life, uh, who Christine was, how, how was she as a person, right? 
and they were talking about how passionate she was, how creative she was, how caring she was, how thoughtful she was, how diligent she was. And then at the graveside, I said, praise the Lord. Those are all wonderful and touching words describing how Christine was. But what about now? What about now? As we witness the casket laying there, what I ask the audience, what, would you, what word would you use to describe Christine now? And then I said, according to the Bible, we can proclaim that she is glorious. Glorious, because she is in the kingdom of glory. Right? So I just pray that that's not the answer of why, but I hope it instills some hope that we may not know all the answers. God knows the answer, and he has a plan beyond our understanding. One of these days, one of these days. Now, so the disciples witness how Jesus was empowered to do his ministry. And this empower, this prayer just empowered Jesus to, to obey God with a grateful um, reverence and awe. And the Lord's Prayer is also teaching us how we can, through prayer, be empowered to obey God gratefully with reverence and awe. Now, it comes to the passage today, uh, Matthew 6, verse 5 through 13. I, I invite you to open your Bible. I didn't put it on here because I want you to bring your Bible. Okay. Matthew 6, verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So I really appreciate the song that we sang this morning in the quiet secret place we encounter God know God more the you in verse 5 is a plural you collected you you all when you all pray you all must not be like the hypocrites now Jesus is not saying that we should not do public prayer. We should not pray in the synagogues. Right? I really appreciate the prayer time of EM every Sunday morning from 9.30 to 10. Right? It's a public prayer leading everybody to pray. Jesus is not saying you don't pray in open. And then at a street corner, because they pray three times a day, and maybe the time of prayer just happened then and you were still on the street. What do you do? You pray on the street. Right? But Jesus, what Jesus is saying is that the motivation, the intention. They just want people to see their prayer. And they go, oh, Father God, you know. 
their intention is for people to recognize that they're religious people. So the you in the verse 5 is a plural, you all, but the you in verse 6 is singular. So you individually pray, go into your room, shut the door, nobody sees you, and you pray privately to the Father who is in secret or in darkness, and your Father sees in secret, will reward you. So the attitude and the audience of our prayer is, is it praise of people that you're seeking, praise and approval, or is it an intimate encounter with the Father in private? So Jesus is saying, private prayer, encounter the Lord and be transparent to your Father. Now, we just sang that in a quiet and secret place, we pray, we encounter God, we want to know God more. It's always wonderful that we can learn about God more. He's our maker. But when we know God more, we will nat naturally be confronted by ourselves. See, God is our maker. If you run some program and something went wrong, you go to the manual and you study it and you go, oh, so I should have done this instead of that. The more we know God, God is calling us to more and more reflect ourselves. Right? We don't just want to know God in a cerebral way. Acknowledging that, okay, the theology and everything, fine. God called us to come into the secret place to open our hearts, to be transparent to him so that the Holy Spirit can search in us so the more we know God, we more know ourselves. Prayer enables us to know the love of our Creator, the Father, more, as well as to know ourselves more. Okay. Our iniquity, our inability to truly obey with gratitude. Okay. So when I heard Aaron share her life script, I was really surprised. A few Sunday, a few Fridays ago, I heard about her life script, and I went, "Is that your life script, or is that my life script?" It's so similar. I first took that test in 2005, the last summer before uh, the summer before my last year of seminary to become. Uh, a servant of the Lord. And then I took that survey and I, I was shocked that there were so many life scripts. Deep down in my heart, I'm telling myself I can never achieve. I don't have what it takes. I don't belong. And prayer in secret God slowly, gradually transformed me. And that secret prayer can take form of a spiritual journal, can take form of a, like what Reverend uh, Felix Liu talked about, writing letter to Jesus. Right? When we write letters to Jesus, when we write our spiritual journal, our prayer journal, we were drawn into knowing God more, asking him questions, and then asking ourselves questions. 
Why am I so afraid of doing this? Why am I so eager of saying that? You know? So it's like marriage. After I married to Lorna, I started to realize my landmines. Sometimes she would say something and I would get irritated. Why? So as we encounter our Father more in a deeper way, inevitably we were confronted by our Maker. And the Holy Spirit starts searching deep in our hearts. <clears throat> now verse 7. And when you, this is a collective you again, when you all pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Then the Lord's Prayer. Pray then like this. So, the word, the, the words, do not heap up empty phrases. This sentence actually in the original text is only one word, one Greek word. And that word is a unique word in the Bible. Nowhere, in, nowhere else in the Bible use this word. Batologeo. Right? And it could mean uh, babbling, just repeating oneself. Now, Jesus is not against re repetitive prayer. He taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. I pray like this. And so each time we pray, we pray like this. It's a repetitive prayer. And Jewish people, when they pray, they always pray a structured prayer. Right? So Jesus is not, is not against repetitive prayers. But that word could also mean nonsense, babbling nonsense. Why? Because the Gentiles don't really believe in the relating God. They don't know the God the God that they pray towards, they don't know where this God is, what is this God like, and they don't even know what they're praying for. Sometimes their prayers is just conflicting, it, it, you know, oneself. So they're, they were babbling nonsense before God and just keep repeating in a in a fearful way, because they are afraid that if I don't speak enough, maybe this God doesn't hear us. And maybe the God doesn't understand what I mean. So out of fear and disbelief, they just keep babbling nonsense before their God or gods. And Jesus said, do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. So later on, we will have a life group discussion. Why, why does God want us to pray? He knows already, right? Why bother? So at times, I admit, sometimes I come to the Lord and say, Oh God, you know. You know. And then... <laughs> Why, why bother? But Jesus said, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now this prayer is a comprehensive prayer. 
we pray and adore and proclaim God's attributes, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We pray and proclaim God's sovereign will, your will, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, meaning not only God's will, but also our obedience. Your will be done on earth, where is the earth? Starting from me, starting from my heart, starting from my mind. Give us this day our daily bread, our physical needs. Forgive us our debts, and we, as we also forgive our debtors, our emotional needs. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one, our spiritual needs. So Jesus is saying, when you pray, when you pray, you need to pray a conscious prayer and a comprehensive petition. And this prayer is for our holistic needs, not out of fear but because of our reverence to an intimate father. So, now the first word in the Greek text of this Lord's Prayer is Father. Father of ours in heaven. And not just heaven, it's plural. Father of ours in heaven in heavens. So, Jewish people in the first century, they recognize God as their father, the father of the Israelites. But they seldom address God as their personal father. It was not until about 10th century that Jewish people started praying to God as their individual father. But Jesus always addressed God as his father. I went through uh, gospel according to John, and I counted how many times Jesus addressed God as his father, and I counted up to 104 times, but I'm sure I have missed some. In John chapter 6, verse 32. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. Verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. My father, my father. And to the Jewish people in the first century, they were going, how, how dare you? How dare you address God, the creator of heaven and earth, your father? But Jesus taught them to pray and pray, Father of ours. But then the question, question is, wait a minute. Verse 6 says when you pray, singular, when you individually pray, you pray in your secret room. And now Jesus say, pray like this, Father of ours. Now, didn't you just say your prayer should be a private prayer reaching out? to the Father, your individual Father. And now you're telling us to pray, saying, Father of ours. Well, why is that? What's the significance of the difference? Well, we can discuss later. But what I think is prayer is an is a intimate connection with our Creator, reaching up and reaching down, knowing God, knowing ourselves. And then it is also a connecting prayer sideways. Right? 
So this hour, who are these hour? Who are us? Well, throughout generations, from the disciples to us, worldwide Christians, when they pray, they pray this prayer, Our Father in heaven. See, this is a universal connection, right? And not only the saints in the past, saints in present, how about your friends? Your friends, your family, some of them are not included in this prayer yet, right? They, they do not know the Father. They haven't received God's grace yet. But we pray that they will one day become us so that we can pray together our Father in heaven. Right? Now, I'm sure you have heard this, that the Lord's Prayer is actually a prayer for the disciples. It's our prayer, not the Lord's Prayer. Jesus didn't need to pray the Lord's Prayer. But actually, if you re read carefully, this is exactly his personal prayer setting up an example so that we can model after him. Because for Jesus, he recognized and he proclaimed that the Father is in heavens, the creator of all the universe. And Jesus, throughout his life, his words and his testimonies, he bring glory to God. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come when Jesus came out to preach. The first word out of his mouth is the kingdom is coming. Right? Repent for the kingdom of God is near. So this is exactly the Lord's prayer. And then your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Throughout his ministry, Jesus proclaimed over and over that God's will be done. First of all, through himself, then to the disciples, then to us. Right? And Jesus needs food. Right? Some, we read in the Bible, he was hungry, he was thirsty. And this is also Lord's Prayer. Probably the only phrase that Jesus did not need to pray is this, forgive me my debts. Because Jesus is sinless. So Jesus didn't need to pray and say, forgive me my debts, but Jesus always forgive his debtors. So, the Lord's Prayer is a conscious and comprehensive prayer, and it helps us to be empowered, to be able to do God's will. And then, we don't have time to go over the Lord's Prayer. It's so, so packed with wonderful teachings. But probably we can go through maybe just your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Your kingdom come, God is, even though this world is still chaotic, God is in reign in a cosmetic way. God rules the human history and even our personal destiny, right? And then this one, your will be done. This is the toughest, I think, that we, that we encounter every day. Your will be done. How do I know God's will? What, what is your will? Right. God revealed his will through his sovereign will. Like I mentioned before, God is in, in reign in the history. Kingdom rises, kingdom falls. And 
Second of all, God has already revealed this preceptive will, and that's the law, the Ten Commandments, the laws, the uh, teachings of Jesus Christ, the whole Bible, the essence of the Bible is already revealed, telling us what to do. But God also gives us the freedom of whether we want to obey or not, right? So the third one, the permissive will. Why would God allow Joseph to be sold to Egypt by his brothers? We don't know. Right? God has a better plan. At that time, Joseph would not be able to understand. Later on, Joseph realized, looking back. Right? So we're, we're in this world where don't you wish God would just give us each one a, a cell phone of life with Google Map, you know, installed in there? Yesterday when I drove to Rose Hills, I have my, you know, cell phone, Google Map running. And then near Tustin, it says, whoa, red. Seven minutes delay. And then the Google says, there will be a seven minutes delay, but you're still on the fastest route. Thank God. That's comforting, right? Don't we all wish we have a Google map in our lives, uh, cell phone, and then we will see, aha, okay, there's a detour, and then fine, we're still on the fastest route although there's some delay, but I'll be fine. We all want God to give us a directive will, show us clear, right? What should I do tomorrow, right? Should I, should I go to Chick-fil-A or hmm, Burger King? Big things, small things, we all want God to just reveal his will to us. But a lot of times, God's will is already there. It's us that we need to obey. Right? God already revealed us pretty much what we should do, what we should not do. But we need to obey. Right? So your will be done in me actually means, Lord, I surrender my will to you. Okay. So the kingdom is already here. The kingdom needs to be realized through us by our submitting to God's will each day. So whether it's career change, whether it's your uh, job search, anything, we can encounter God's leading every day. Right? Um, when I first, uh, my first job in the United States was uh, in a laboratory in a small hospital, USC affiliated hospital. I like I like the job, but for five years, the hospital wasn't doing too well, and no, no change of salary for five years, no increase, no adjustment. And I started praying. I said, Lord, this, I, I, I can't afford to live in San Gabriel with this salary. Right? So I prayed the Lord to lead me. I mailed out at least 50, 60 resumes, you know, 50 copies to all the big hospitals all over the United States. No response. Lorna and I went back to Taiwan for vacation, came back, there was a message from a doctor in Boston University Medical School. I don't recognize the name, I didn't send him resume. So I replied the call, 
And then I found out I applied, I did apply a job in DU Medical School, but that job was already taken by somebody else. So the department actually forward my resume to the personnel office. And this new doctor needs somebody to head the EM lab. And so the personnel says, there's one here. You know, try it out. And so God closed 50, 60 windows on me. And then there was this unexpected door open for me. Big things, little things. I just recently heard a testimony. A sister told me she started praying for her own marriage at the age of 14. Okay? Pray every day for her marriage. And then the first time she saw this man, this young man, she went, that's the one God prepared for me. Whoa. And they actually got married and have children, and what a blessed life. Sometimes God will give us very clear directive, telling us exactly what's going to happen. Sometimes, or should I say most of the times, God gave us some outlines, principles, and then we need to discern, right? Through prayer, through the wisdom, God gave us. We pray, we discern, we, encounter, we encounter God, and sometimes we just have to bite the bullet and trusting that even if we misstep, God will somehow, in some mysterious ways, right our wrongs. So through prayer, our Father longs to encounter us intimately and empower us holistically to fulfill His will. Let us pray. Our Father, may your kingdom come in our lives, in our family, in our school, in our work. May your will be done through me as it is in heaven. May your will be done in your house as it is in heaven. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll stand. Christ in me is to live, to die is to give. Christ in me is to live. Christ in me is to live, to die is to give. Christ in me is to live, to die is to Peace, peace, my peace is my
many things sometimes uh, we forget some of the most basic things it's just the way that you modeled your relationship uh, with God Father you show us what it means to rely on the Father to entrust our lives to the Father what it means to obey the Father, to love the Father and to delight in Him. And we thank you for showing us this example so that we could go and live it out. Even more than that, we thank you that you laid down your life so that we could have a real personal relationship with our God and call Him our Heavenly Father. Thank you for being the one who redeemed us and brought us back into the family. Help us to relate to our Father, to enjoy being His children. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tsai. God bless you all.